Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Father Chris Alar. I'm one of the Marian priests located at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. You might recognize our shrine daily on EWTN if you tune in at three o'clock and see the broadcast of the Divine Mercy Chaplet. You may also know some of our well-known priests, Father Michael Gately with his 33 Days to Morning Glory and Consecration to Mary, which we'll be talking about, and Father Don Calloway with his best-selling book, Champions of the Rosary, which is also Marian. And so as Marians of the Immaculate Conception, we are about Mary. And people say, well, Father, how do you guys end up in divine mercy? Remember, God's greatest gift of mercy ever bestowed on a creature is the Immaculate Conception. So that's where we begin tonight. We are going to begin tonight with the very precious gift of God's mercy. And it is Mary. So I like to begin, first of all, by saying, and most of all, pointing out that Mary is a gift. She's not a distraction from our Lord, as many people believe. She is the mother of Jesus, and she is also the mother of the church. And since this is the case, why is she the mother of us? Because the body of Christ is the church. And if she is, and we make up the church, she's also the mother of us. Nobody wants to disrespect their mother. Now, John, at the foot of the cross, received this mother, and we're going to talk about that more from Christ himself. We all know that there is no salvation outside of Jesus, and Jesus' body is the church, so we need the church for salvation. Don't think you don't need this church. You do. This is Noah's Ark. In fact, it kind of looks like Noah's Ark, doesn't it? Look at, the, look at the top here. So to be a full member of the church, we need the church's mother. This is Mary. Jesus gave us the church, and he gave us the mother of the church, Mary, to get us to heaven. These are the two tools. Basically, our Catholic faith teaches us to Jesus through Mary and the church. And so this is what we need to focus on. I start here with a very quick two-minute video that I, I've read and watched many articles and watched many videos. This is a really good clip that I think shows you who Mary is. But warning, this guy talks faster than I do. So let's take a look. What do Catholics believe about Mary? Why do Catholics treat Mary so highly? Why do they put so much emphasis on Mary? Why do they go around and say, Hail Mary, Hail Mary all the time? Isn't that against the Bible? We're going to be talking about that in two minutes, right after this. Catholics love Mary, just as Jesus did. And we honor her highly. And why? Because God did. God was the first one to honor Mary by raising her up to be the mother of the Most High Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Eternal One Himself. She was going to be His mother, the only one on earth in history to have this honor. And God says in Scripture, all through the Old Testament, that we must honor those who he honors. And so we just follow God's example by honoring Mary as he did. He was the one who raised her up. In fact, in Luke 1:42, Elizabeth, inspired by the Holy Spirit, cries out to Mary and says, blessed are you among all women. Blessed are you and blessed is the fruit of your womb. I mean, we say that in the, the prayer of the Hail Mary, but she's blessing Mary and we bless Mary as well in return. In fact, in Luke 1, 48, all generations, it says, shall call Mary blessed. Catholics just follow the example of the Bible. And if you want to see an actual conversation I had with two Bible Christians on the street corner about this topic, check it out up there. But the bottom line is that Mary is blessed. We know that she's not God. We know she's just a creature and without God, she's nothing, nothing at all without God. Here's the way Catholics see it. Imagine if you go to a museum 
and you see the most beautiful picture, the most beautiful work of art you've ever seen in your whole entire life. And you just can't stop looking at it. Everyone's crowding around it. They're all complimenting different parts of it. And then all of a sudden, the artist who painted it comes up from behind. Do you just look at the artist and say, oh, oh, hi, how you doing? No, you'd be like, oh, you painted this? Everyone would flock to the artist, wanting to shake his hand, wanting to get an autograph. How did you do it? How long did it spend? You are magnificent. Your work of art is amazing. They praise the artist. Now, of course, they're looking at the painting and they're honoring it and they're remarking about how wonderful it is. But one once they see the artist, all praise goes to the artist. Now Mary's wonderful. God made her so beautiful and obedient and humble and a great woman of faith. And we respect and honor her for that. But we give all praise and all glory and all honor to God because he's the one who made her. He's the one who sustains her. He's the one who does all that in her. And we praise him through the work that he made. Do you guys get all that? <laughs> That guy talks a million miles an hour, but he crammed 10 pounds of bacon in a two pound bag. And what he said was very true. As he said in the video, God honored Mary above all creatures. Why can't we? This is a great question. Now, God could make his own mother. If you could make your own mother, wouldn't you make her perfect? You know, if I could make my own mother, she'd be spotless. I asked my seventh graders that once. I said, wouldn't you guys make your own mom perfect if you could? And one said, no, because then she'd make me do my homework. <laughs> but the point is, we all would. And the Catholic understanding of his Mary is not worship. So many non-Catholics think we worship Mary. We do not. Jesus is the goal. Mary is the guide. You don't get anywhere. I'm not going to climb Mount Everest without a God. My goal is to get to the top. My goal is to get to God. My goal is to get to Christ. And God, my, my goal is not the guide leading me up there. That's my help. That's who Mary is. She's the guide to get us up there. This is what's important. So let's look at this slide. Now, in Genesis, who crushes the head of the serpent? Ha <laughs> ha. You just guessed, Mary, because that's the topic of this talk. <laughs> the, the Bible actually depends on which translation you're reading. Some say he will crush your he head. And others, like the Dewey Reams from the Vulgate, say she will crush your head. And you know what? It really, theologians tells us, doesn't matter. Either one, because it is together. It is together. In some translations, we see it flat out. It says she. She is part of this, Mary. Now, it makes sense for it to be Mary. These are her feet, are they not? Because I have a question, and you're probably going to guess the answer because of the topic of this talk. But who does Satan fear more, God or Mary? Oh, now, how are you here? I heard some hesitation. Mary, Mary. Yes, but there's a reason. Why in the world would Satan fear Mary more than God. Well, you know what? I was a wrestler. I said I started wrestling in third grade. Now they're holding the Pennsylvania State Championships right down the road, right? Some real good talent over there, I bet. Now, it's interesting because I started wrestling in third grade. And when I got older, I got pretty good. My sophomore year, I ended up undefeated in one realm. And in my junior year, I started thinking, oh, you know, I'm probably going to have a pretty good year here. Well, the very early part of my junior year, I went to a tournament and I drew a guy by the name of Dave Dameron, who ended up going to the University of Michigan on a full ride. He was the number one ranked wrestler in the United States of America at my weight class. And I drew him first match. Now, the fact that I'm telling you this story, guess who won? I got killed. Now... There's a moral to the story, though. And I really didn't get killed. I, I actually hung in there with them. But, you know, it was the first time that my dad and my coach both said, good job. Good job. Now, it was a loss. Why in the world would that be the first time both my coach and my dad told me, good job? The reason was, this was Dave Dameron. He was the best of the best. And it was kind of understood that this was a guy that was pretty much going to take me to school. But yet... 
I didn't win, but good job. Now I want to flash back to when I was in the fourth grade. No offense, ladies. But when I was in the fourth grade, there was a tournament in Michigan, and I had to wrestle a girl. Now, back then in the Detroit tournaments, when they would call your weight, all the kids would gather in a classroom, and they would call your weight class, and all the kids would be together, and they'd call two names, and you would come and grab your bout card, and you would line up waiting for an open mat two by two, like two little Noah's Ark animals. And you would wait two by two until the mat opened up and you would go wrestle. So I'm standing next to this little girl. I'm in fourth grade. She's in fourth or fifth grade. And this girl starts mouthing off. Well, I won the Hazel Park tournament. I won the Van Dyke tournament. I won the Hoover tournament. I won this. I won that. I got 12 medals. I won my last 18 matches. All this and that. And I'm just sitting there. And my dad, Mr. Politically Correct, who's the coach, my coach, is standing next to me listening to this. And my dad looks over at this little girl and he says, well, you're not going to win this one. <laughs> I was scared to death. <laughs> I was petrified. Why do you think I was petrified? Because if I lost that match, my dad would disown me. My friends would laugh me off the playground. What was it about? My pride. My pride. That was the problem. You see, losing to Dave Dambron wasn't a disgrace. But my pride, losing to a girl, was a disgrace. Now, Satan can halfway understand getting whooped up on by God. God is God. Satan knows it. He can halfway get that. But to lose to a 15-year-old Jewish girl is more than his pride can take. He fears Mary more than Satan. Don't you think you want to use that tool? That's an amazing tool if we just simply use it. You know, I was in North Carolina when I was getting ready to become a priest. And back then, I used to go to the barber. Now I cut my own hair. So if it is lopsided on the, on the camera, Mark, please level my head back off. Now, I went to the barber shop, and I was in the barber chair one day, and Billy, the Protestant barber, kind of followed my story. I was getting ready to leave for the Marian Fathers, and he said to me when I was in that chair, are you really going to go through with it? Are you really going to become a Catholic priest? And I said, God willing, I hope so. And just then there was an old man in the chair next to me, and he overheard the conversation. He goes, huh, you're going to spend your whole life in some monastery praying to a bunch of Hail Marys. And I looked over with as much love as I could muster. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, sir, you must be a Bible-loving evangelical Christian. Yeah. I said, that's great. Can you please remind me what the first chapter of Luke, especially verse 26 through 56, says? says it's about the birth of Jesus. I said, yeah, but there's more in there. I mean, part of the story. What's in there? It's about the birth of Jesus. Yeah, but there's more in there. And I says, what's, what's in there? This is what's in there. The Hail Mary prayer. When the angel came to Mary, the angel said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Notice this first line up there. And then Mary goes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth calls her blessed. In other words, holy Mary, blessed. And she calls the child in her womb, blessed. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Then she says, how is it that the mother of my Lord, holy Mary, mother of God. Then it goes on to say, pray for us sinners, which is throughout the Bible. Now, this is interesting because David also exclaimed, how can the ark of my Lord come to me? This is 2 Samuel. Elizabeth was comparing Mary to the new ark of the covenant or the ark of the new covenant. This is fascinating. Scott Hahn talks about this others. This is who Elizabeth was referring to Mary as, the new ark. And then Mary says, all generations will call me blessed. And I said this to the guy. 
And I said, sir, if Mary in Scripture says, all generations will call me blessed, why can't you? And then I said, Billy? And th this was interesting because I, I asked the guy, I said, sir, what, what was it that caused John the Baptist to leap in the womb? He says, the voice of, or the, the, the presence of Jesus. And I said, but what does Scripture specifically say caused John the Baptist to leap in the womb of Elizabeth. He says, the presence of Jesus. Yes, it all is that. But what specifically does it say in Scripture right before that? So then I said, Billy, hand me that Bible. Now, I was pretty confident, but as I started flipping through that Bible, I had this fear that this is some Protestant version that they took out. <laughs> so I'm flipping through it, and sure enough, there it is. What does it say that, that happened right before John the Baptist leapt in the womb? What caused him? The sound of Mary's voice. It's right here, sir. It's right here. This is powerful. And I said, sir, Jesus fulfills the Davidic kingdom. In the Davidic kingdom, who was the queen? Was it the wife of the king? Yeah, well, gee, pick one of your 700. Because these Davidic kings had 700 wives, 1,000 wives. Was it the first wife, the prettiest wife, the smartest wife, the oldest wife? Who was it? it? was the mother. This is who the queen was. We know this from 1 Kings. She had the function of counselor to the king in regards to all matters. How do we know this? Proverbs and 2 Chronicles. This is powerful. The old ark, the new ark. You know, David took the ark of the covenant up into the hillside for three months. What did Mary do? She took the Ark of the New, she was the Ark, and she took the New Covenant up into the hillside for three months to visit Elizabeth. So I'm saying this to the guy. I'm saying, you know, facts are, I was in the Holy Land, and most evidence shows that the Elizabeth, where Elizabeth was with this scene with Mary, was exactly where David was when he danced in front of the Ark. And what does the, Scott Hahn say? The same word for leapt in the womb of John the Baptist? was danced. What a connection. What a connection. This guy didn't say too much after that, but I walked out of there thinking, gee, I hope I was right. <laughs> well, anyway, we are right. The Catholic's role of Mary is critically important. She's not a distraction. She is a needed gift. Now, I'm going to give you your catechism quiz. Who can tell me one of the four Marian dogmas. What are the four Marian dogmas? And who can tell me any of them? Shout them out. The Immaculate Conception, good job, that's one. The Assumption, good job, that's two. Not the Coronation. Mary, the Mother of God, very good. We got one more. Mary's perpetual virginity. Now, we're going to talk about each of those four, and they're fascinating. Let's start with this one. What do you think this one is? Mary, the mother of God. How, how can you Catholics call her the mother of God? God is eternal. He has no beginning. Therefore, he has no mother. Do you all know how to explain that? How do you defend that? Well, we're going to try. First of all, you start with this. You must be non-Catholic. Yes. Well, do you know that all the Protestant fathers accepted this doctrine? That Mary was the mother of God. Martin Luther, Martin Luther John Calvin, Zwingli, they all accepted it. All of them. Now, to help you understand this a little better, I got a question for you. Was Mary, excuse me, let me rephrase this. Was Jesus a human person? No. Now, before you pick up your cell phone and call the bishop <laughs> and have me shut down, hear me out. Now, we believe as Catholics that we have one God or three gods? One God. How many persons? Three. three. All right. The Father is how many persons? There's a little hesitation there. The Son is how many persons? Say that again. 
The sun is how many persons? One. The spirit is how many persons? One. All right. From the beginning of time, God has been three persons in one God. God the Father is one person, God the Son is one person, and God the Holy Spirit is one person. Now, each of those persons has a nature. Those persons are divine. Would anybody argue that? We all agree, right? All three of those persons are divine, correct? Okay. God the Father is divine. God the Son is divine. God the Holy Spirit is divine. Now, each of them share in the same nature. And that nature is divine. God's essence. His nature. Now, for all eternity, that second person of the Trinity was one divine person who had a divine nature. Now, what happened at the Incarnation? That one person, that one second person of the Trinity that was divine, correct? Do we all agree on that? Divine. And had a divine nature, came to earth and assumed a human nature. So I kind of tricked you. Jesus is fully God, fully man, but in his nature not his person. The catechism defines Jesus Christ as one person, two natures. Don't believe me? Look it up. Jesus Christ is one person, two natures. That person, that second person of the Trinity, who already had a divine nature, came to earth incarnate and assumed a human nature. Okay? So is he fully God? Yes. Is he fully man? Yes. In his nature. But he's one person. If Jesus was two persons, we'd have four members of the Trinity. You would have a divine father, a divine son, a human son, and a divine spirit. You'd have four persons in the Trinity. Do we ever say we have four persons in the Trinity? No. Jesus was fully God and fully man in his nature. Now, when Mary gave birth, do you give birth to a person or a nature? A person. So when Mary gave birth, she gave birth to a person who had a divine nature and she gave him his human nature. Now, that person that she gave birth to, not the natures, the natures are human and the natures are divine, but the person she gave birth to is divine. That is why we can call Mary the mother of God. She gave birth to the divine person, the second person of the Trinity who already had a a divine nature and assumed a human nature. We can call Mary the mother of God, not because she created God and his divinity, but because she gave birth to the divine person who had a divine nature and assumed a human nature. This is unbelievable. Pope uh, Pius said, To deny Mary as the mother of God is to deny the incarnation. Either Jesus is not God or Jesus is two persons. And that is the Nestorian heresy. One human and one divine. He is one person, two natures. Those natures are human and divine. He is fully God, fully man in his nature, but his person is divine. And Mary gave birth to a person, and that person is divine. Mary is the mother of God. Y'all get that? (laughs) Beautiful. All right, the next one. Anybody know what this picture is of? Tradition that Mary was offered in the temple and consecrated. And we'll talk about consecration a little bit. That Mary was consecrated. And this here is a symbol of her virginity. This is her perpetual virginity. Now, do you know this also was accepted by the fathers of the Protestant Reformation? Zwingli said this, listen, 
I firmly believe that she remained a virgin, pure and intact in childbirth and also after childbirth for all eternity. Really? But Father, doesn't, uh, doesn't the Bible say Jesus had brothers and sisters? Doesn't it? Yeah. How do you explain? Well, first of all, the Bible's written in the Greek. You got to look at the words here. Adelphos. And in the Hebrew, ah. They could mean either not just a brother, but a cousin or a close relative. There's nothing against church teaching that Joseph could have been widowed and had children from a previous marriage. And Jesus would have had stepbrothers. He, we know he had cousins. John the Baptist was his cousin. So these could be the close relatives that in the word of the ancient language means brother. Now, brothers can be close relatives, as I said. Jesus would not have given Mary to John on the cross if he had any biological brothers. He couldn't do it. Now, it's funny because I, you know how sometimes you forget where you're at when you speak? I was in Nashville, and I totally forgot where I was. And I said, now, I was all passionate about Mary, and I said, now, how can you be? And I, I said, you know what, let me give you an example. Lot. Remember Lot from the Old Testament? Who was Lot? Abraham's what? Nephew, if you're reading Genesis 11, 27. But if you're reading Genesis 14, 14, Lot is his brother. Now, I said to the group in Nashville, now, how can you be both your brother and your nephew? And I'm sure there's some country song that can explain that. <laughs> and then I literally went, oh no, I'm sorry. I forgot I'm in Nashville. And it was a men's conference too. They laughed. Then in the Bible, it says the brothers of Jesus, James and Joseph, the sons of Mary. Man, that seems to slam us Catholics right in the mouth. The brothers of Jesus, James and Joseph, the sons of Mary. Man, you can't get any more incrimination than that. But you got to keep reading. You keep reading and it'll show you who, what Mary they're talking about. They're not talking about our Mary. They're talking about Mary, the wife of Clopas. All right, next one. What about the assumption? This is the assumption. What's going on there? Mary's body is being assumed into heaven. How do we know Mary's assumed? Is it in the scriptures? Not necessarily. But what we can tell you why Mary was assumed is because the church says so. But in addition to that, y'all know you're all Catholics. One of the first things that Christians did in the ancient times after, the, after Christ and the apostles was relics. What are relics? Relics are where you preserve a bone or some part of the body of a saint. Now, the relics that we have for the saints are a precious part of the church. If Mary, by the time she died, was well known as the mother of Jesus in the known world. Do you think if Mary died and her body was left behind, we wouldn't see relics? You bet we would. Every town, Ephesus, Nazareth, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, they would all be claiming the relics of Mary, saying, come to our town. It would have been the first tourist trap. Come to our town, see the relics of Mary, the mother of Jesus. No town has ever claimed her relics. Why? They don't exist. They don't exist. She was assumed body and soul into heaven. Revelation eleven nineteen 19 says, The ark is now in heaven, followed by a vision of a woman clothed with the sun who gives birth to a male child who rules over all nations. This woman has to be Mary. Let's go on to this one. What's the fourth one? The Immaculate Conception. Something also all Protestant fathers accepted. How do we know Mary's Immaculately Conceived? Is that in the Bible? Well, we can figure this one out. Remember a second ago I just told you that Jesus had a divine nature and a human nature, right? He was fully God and fully man in his nature. Where did Jesus get his human nature from? Where did Jesus get his human nature? Now, he already had a divine nature from all eternity. But when he was born, where did he get his human nature from? Mary. Mary. Now, 
Could Mary give Jesus a broken human nature? No way. Could Jesus accept and have a broken human nature? No way. So Mary could not have a broken human nature. What is the result of original sin? We now have a broken human nature. If Mary had original sin, she would have to have a broken human nature. And if she had a broken human nature, she would pass it on to Jesus, and he would have had a broken human nature. Jesus can't accept a broken human nature. Therefore, Mary couldn't have a broken human nature. Therefore, she had to be conceived without original sin. This is the immaculate conception. God can't coexist with any sin in Mary's womb. There could be no sin. Her very DNA is in the blood of Jesus. Her very DNA. You cannot have sin in there. This doctrine doesn't say that Mary didn't need a savior. This is what non-Catholics tell us. Well, wait a minute, Father. You're telling me that if she didn't have any sin, well, then you're telling me she doesn't need a savior. Oh, yes, I am telling you she needed a savior. Why? Because she was preserved from sin before her conception. We were cleansed of sin after our conception in baptism and confession. Both needed a savior. Did you hear that? Just because she was preserved before her conception and we were cleansed after, both need a savior. We're not claiming that. In Genesis 3, both, listen to this, this is the church fathers. In Genesis 3, both Jesus and Mary are said to be in the state of enmity against the serpent, which in the original Hebrew, Hebrew means complete and radical opposition to Satan. Listen to this. It is for this reason that it is not likely that God would have permitted Mary to inherit the condition of original sin from Adam and Eve. Any participation by her in the disorder and corruption of the soul that the rest of us inherit from Adam and Eve would place the mother of Jesus at least partially under the rule of Satan and thereby contradict the words of Scripture of complete enmity between the woman and the serpent. Mary could not be controlled even in the slightest way by Satan. And if she had original sin, she would be under partial control of Satan. We all are because of our broken human nature. This is powerful stuff. Now, I don't have time to go into the co-mediatrix and the mediatrix of all, or co-redemptrix and the mediatrix of all graces, but I'll say this. People freak out when we call Mary co-redeemer. Why? Father, only Jesus can redeem us. Is this true? Yeah. Only Jesus can redeem us. Well, then, Father, why are you crazy Catholics calling her co-redeemer? Well, first of all, she gave Christ his body, the tool of redemption. And co in Latin means cum. Does not mean equal to. It means with. She was a redeemer with Jesus, not equal to Jesus. Paul calls us co-workers. Are we equal to God? No. Paul doesn't say we are, but he calls us co-workers with God. No, we have to understand this. What about mediatrix of all graces? Mary participated in a unique way in the reception of grace by the world. It's only fitting that she participates in a unique way by distributing grace into the world. This is how the church father saw it. What are you looking at on the screen there? Adam and Eve. All right. What one title, and we're going to take a break here in a few minutes. What one title, more than any other, did the church fathers call Mary? Gotcha. Somebody must have heard one of my other talks. The New Eve. Well, I guess it's pretty obvious if it's on the screen. The New Eve. I want to tell you something. This is powerful. I'm going to steal here from Justin Martyr and Tertullian because I think it's beautiful. You know what Justin Martyr said? He said, Eve, this one on the screen, Adam and Eve, was a virgin and undefiled. But because she was disobedient, 
she conceived the false word of the serpent and gave birth to suffering and death in the world. That's Justin Martyr. Now listen to this. He said, Mary also was a virgin and undefiled, but because she was obedient, she conceived the true word incarnate and she gave birth to the God-man who brought salvation to the world. Now, here comes Tertullian. I love this. So the same sex, the female, that conceived and brought death into the world had to be the same sex that would conceive and restore life into the world. Eve made room for the fall of the first Adam. Mary made room for the reparation of it by the second Adam. Eve caused death. Mary brought life. Now here's what Tertullian said, and I love it. He asked the question, did Satan overthrow Adam or Eve? Which one did Satan overthrow? Did Satan overthrow Adam or did Satan overthrow Eve? I heard some Eves. I heard some Adams. Did I hear any both? Both. Both. Satan didn't overthrow just Adam. Satan didn't overthrow just Eve. Satan overthrew both. Now listen to Tertullian. If Satan overthrew both sexes, which he did, the male and the female, it will take both sexes to liberate humanity from Satan. Therefore, there was a promise in the garden of both a new Adam and a new Eve. Who was the new Adam? Jesus. Who's the new Eve? Mary. If Satan overthrew Adam and Eve, it is going to take a new Adam and a new Eve. This is how God set it up. This is how I should say he responded to Satan. He just didn't say, I'm going to get you back with a new Adam. He says, yeah, the new Adam is the primary, but you know what? He's going to be assisted by the new Eve. I want them to stand together instead of being torn apart. What happened after the fall? Did Adam and Eve embrace each other and say, oh, I'm sorry, honey, it's okay. No way. Adam, there's a real man. When God looked down and said, what happened? Adam said, whoa, wait a minute, Lord. It's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. Is this standing together? No. God wants to repair that damage. That damage. God knew that we were skittish and afraid of him after the fall. So what does he do? He gives us the gift of somebody that we can trust, one of our own. We should trust God first and foremost, but he knows we're broken. So the best way that he calls us to himself is to by coaxing us through the gift of one of our own creatures, Mary. And I'm going to finish with this story and we could take our break. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to go fishing with my father. And when I would go fishing with my father, we would go to this place in Monroe, Michigan called the River Raisin. And we would fish upstream, beautiful scenery and everything up there. We'd catch smallmouth bass left and right. And my dad had this very special gold eagle claw rod. And he would use this rod. And when it seemed like every time that he would have that rod and I happened to look over, I would just in awe stare at that rod as he'd cast it in reel. And it seemed almost every time I'd look at that rod, it would bow over with another big bass. So my father used to tell me when we would come back and forth from fishing, we'd have like 30 rods in the basement. And he said, Chris, you can use any rod in the basement, just not this rod. Who does that sound like? <laughs> you can eat from any tree in the garden, just not this tree. Chris, you can fish with any rod in the basement, just not this rod. Sure enough, I thought that rod was magical. So one day my dad's off to work. I'm telling you right now, I was convinced it was magic. My dad goes to work, it's summer. My buddies come over, they want to go fishing. So, you know what? In my pride, I wanted to be the hero. I was going to take that rod and I was going to catch all the fish. And then I was going to be looked upon by my friends as the master angler. Now, when that kind of pride hits you, you're setting up for the fall. Because what happened? I gave them two crummy rods. Said, here you go, guys. These are our best rods. <laughs> and I took the best rod. 
They go up the stairs with their rods. I grab the rod like little Opie Taylor. I'm Andy Griffith. I put the rod on my shoulder. I go chugging upstairs. I'm all excited. I can't wait. And as I'm in my excitement, I rush out the door and I slam the door behind me. And guess what? Snap went the fishing rod. Right in half. So all of a sudden, there I am in complete panic as a nine-year-old. You know, I have heart problems now, and I wonder if it was from that moment. <laughs> and I was so foolish. Guess what I did? I actually took a piece of tape and tried to tape that rod together. What did Adam and Eve do? They did the same thing. They tried to hide it. They had to try to hide their sin. So I tried to hide my sin. I wrapped it in tape. I thought maybe my dad won't notice it. But finally it got to me. My, my pride crumbled and the fear set in. And I finally decided it was time to come clean. But I was afraid of my father. So guess who I ran to? My mom. And I said, Mom, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I didn't do it. Don't let dad get mad at me. Blah, 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 blah. So my mom understands. She's listening to this whole thing. And so my mom really understood. She saw how sorry I was. And she says, well, we're going to have to tell dad. And I'm panicked. I'm panicked. I'm like, mom, please, please don't let dad get mad at me. Please tell him you use the rod. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, we are not going to lie to dad. So sure enough, dad comes home. Mom's standing in the kitchen with the broken fishing rod. Just at that moment, my dad starts to undo his belt. And I knew what that meant. Please, don't think my dad abused me. There was nothing like that. It was loving discipline. But he started to undo the belt. And he came towards me. And my mom met him head on. And she said, he has suffered enough. She interceded for me. She was the one I ran to. She was the one that interceded for me. And she stopped my dad dead in his tracks. St. Faustina said God's angel was going to strike at a town in Poland and his hand was ready to strike and she held it back. Mary held the hand back. You know, it's interesting because we understand the role of intercession and the story of Father Stephen Shire who died in the car wreck and went before the judgment seat of throne. He makes it very clear. His one message of, of his story is the Trinity cannot say no to Mary. They are perfectly aligned in their will. If she requests something, they honor it. The Trinity cannot say no to Mary. If Mary intercedes for you, if you ask her to help you, you have an advocate before the throne of God. The Trinity. You see, God is what? Mercy or justice? Both. What is Mary? Mercy. She's God's, and I hate to say this, please. I'm sure some theologian could write me up on charges. But I believe Mary's God's own loophole to his own justice. Because she's all mercy. And she can intercede for us and help us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.